I want to just back up for a moment and talk about what happens in the muscles when we are trying to grow them. Okay. So obviously you want to have a tough workout. You want to have a, uh, a workout with resistance training where there have been at least 10 hard working sets. Uh, a hard working set is kind of, there's a couple of different ways that you might classify or qualify them, but you're either getting very close to failure or you have increased the volume such that, so maybe your RPE is like an, an eight or a nine out of 10, meaning like your rate of perceived exertion on that set was an eight, a nine, even maybe a 10, or you increase your volume and maybe your RPE is a little lower. So instead of it being like you have to work an eight or a nine or a 10, maybe your RPE is like a six or a seven, but you have more volume. So instead of doing three sets, maybe you're doing five. Instead of four sets, maybe you're doing six, that kind of thing. So that is what I would classify when I say a tough workout. It means like you're kind of finished afterwards, right? Um, maybe soreness the next day, not necessarily. You don't need to be sore all the time. Soreness is more a function of novelty than it is around an effective workout. But if you're never sore after a workout, it means you're not working hard enough, right? If you're always sore, <laughs> you know, the con uh, the opposite, if you're always sore, um, you're probably working the muscle too often in the lengthened position. We'll, we'll come back to that. But I just wanted to kind of define tough workout. What's a tough workout? It's like 10 hard working sets. Okay. So when we're thinking about skeletal muscle, right? So we're thinking about growing that skeletal muscle. It's regulated at least, well, there's many things that regulate it, but in terms of like molecular processes, uh, we're looking at things like satellite cell activity. So we have these cells um, and without kind of getting into a lot of details here, we are kind of donating these satellite cells to the muscle. Like when we look at the muscle, it's multinucleated. There's not just one nucleus, there's several. Um, so we have the satellite cell activity, we have gene transcription, and we have protein translation. All of these things, okay, so these are just like big nerdy words. Uh, they're strongly influenced by IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which is a proxy for growth hormone. This is actually how we might measure growth hormone. And when we optimize our estrogen levels, okay, so this is where, this is why I want to talk about estrogen. When we optimize our estrogen levels, these muscle building processes, the satellite cell activity, the gene transcription, the protein translation, they are going to be supported with optimal levels of estrogen, which is going to lead to an increased rate of lean muscle tissue accrual. What the hell am I saying here? Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about this from the lens of a perimenopausal woman. And then I want to talk about my menopausal ladies because I promise I will not forget you. I never will. Okay, so we know from the menstrual cycle that your progesterone rises once you ovulate. So you cannot produce progesterone unless you ovulate. Okay, so we ovulate somewhere day 14, day 15, day 16, whatever. Um, and then progesterone starts to rise progesterone's job other like obviously progesterone is going to be priming the endometrium for implantation that's obviously one of her primary roles but she also will down regulate estrogen okay so she will reduce estradiol's role in the development of the endometrium because in the follicular phase estrogen is the primary anabolic hormone right so it's it's called the follicular phase because estrogen is and specifically estradiol is working to develop the um uh, the follicle and to, to a, a secondary effect, the endometrial lining. Progesterone will decrease the concentration of estrogen receptors in the endometrium. She will increase the enzymes, like progesterone's not playing, okay? She increases the enzymes that convert estradiol to estrone, which is kind of like a weaker uh, estrogen, and then increases estrone locally. So progesterone basically comes in as like, thanks so much, boo, but I don't need you anymore. Right? So it's like, we're going to just decrease your receptors, right? So you can't activate anything. And the estradiol that's around, we're actually going to just convert you 
to a weaker form of yourself. Okay. So this is what progesterone does. And the other thing it does too, for, for my clinicians that are listening, as you may know, is it also increases estrone sulfatase. So it also is it's also degrade, degrading the estrone locally that's being produced, right? So um, it, it's basically rendering estrogen neutral. So estrogen's like the big, you know, the big uh, kind of personality, if you will, in the first half of the cycle. And then progesterone comes in the second half of the cycle. It's like, actually settle down. I'm here now. I got it. I'll take care of everything. So why I'm telling you this is particularly for my women in um, late perimenopause. So early perimenopause, we have the problem of having sometimes too much estrogen. It goes unchecked relative to progesterone. So a lot of women in their early 40s, like 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, we are, we are running estrogen dominant in the luteal phase of the cycle. Okay. And then it, after 45, call it like my, usually my experience tells me some, sometime around 47, 48 years of age. Now we start to see not only is progesterone low in this woman, but now we also see estrogen, all sorts of estrogen, but primarily estradiol is starting to decrease as well, right? The ovaries are no longer able to support the type of production that we once had in our twenties and our thirties. So we st- we start to see lowered levels of estrogen in our late forties. Okay. Now why I am going on and on about this estrogen plays a role in growth hormone production, both the anabolic. So the muscle hypertrophy, uh, and lipolytic effects, right. Um, that have been well elucidated, um, uh, that, that happens from, from, from training. So the, bo- the bottom line here is that without adequate estrogen, so this is for my ladies that are 47, eight, nine, 51, two, three, et cetera. Uh, without adequate estrogen, your growth hormone levels can suffer, which is going to generally make gaining muscle and losing body fat more difficult. So some of you 55 year olds, I can already hear you saying like, duh, I get it. I already know that. Right. But this is why, this is part of the reason why we have sort of this central uh, belly gain, if you will. Like there's, there are other factors, there's cortisol and there's some other things. But a lot of times when we are gaining excess adipose tissue, fat, uh, ectopic fat distribution through the belly and other areas, like kind of throughout the body, um, part of it is because of our hampered ability to produce growth hormone because of this lowered estrogen levels. Okay, so said another way, (laughs) all that to say growth hormone works better with estrogen. Okay. Um, and this is why training is so very important because I've mentioned that testosterone is anabolic. Estrogen is also anabolic as well, right? So the more that we are lifting weights, the better that we are going to have that post exercise rise in testosterone, hopefully in estrogen, um, as well. (laughs) 